Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for the very kind uh, invitation for the Maastricht uh, 30 conference. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, pleasure and honor uh, to be with you and to speak to you in this prestigious and important conference. And please allow me as a last speaker uh, to... Um, uh, to yeah, the last speaker of the present panel, I'm sorry, yeah, to take a more, uh, correct, uh, to take a more uh, 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 general approach why I, I, I outline the main uh, um, uh, proposition and main uh, points of the Hungarian um, uh, positions with regard to the institutional uh, reforms. Looking back to the Maastricht uh, uh, process 30 years after is indeed a very um, topical uh, and timely uh, question. Uh, it's, it's, it's more timely than ever. Uh, Maastricht is much more than a Dutch town. It's much more uh, than a simple treaty revision. Uh, Maastricht um, is much more than all that. Uh, there was a, a famous German rock band, um, Scorpions, uh, and, and they have a song. Uh, uh, called Wind of Change. And I think Maastricht and the Maastricht process is part of this Wind of Change, uh, a symbolic part of it. Uh, imagine that a dark chapter of communism and an artificial division of Europe uh, ended. A new era uh, began that made possible for the European nations to take their destinies and their future into their own hand again. Uh, so Maastricht is not only marked by a major shift in the history of the European integration, but also opened a new uh, era. And it was, a, it was an era of general optimism and high hopes, if you remember. Some even dreamt about the end of history. And there was a firm belief uh, in the progress of the European uh, integration. Uh, the then president of the European Commission, Jacques Delors, even compared the European integration to a bicycle. You need to constantly pedal it uh, in order not to fall. So that's the, a belief in the progress. Um, it, has, it has to progress, always has to progress. And with Maastricht, the integration entered a new uh, dimension. But the, the big question is, uh, did Maastricht fulfill the high uh, uh, hopes of Europe? Or, on the co contrary, did it fail to live up those expectations? And I think 30 years might provide uh, a time span long enough to contemplate these questions. And it's also necessary to contemplate these questions uh, in order to be able to put into context uh, the, the, the question of institutional uh, uh, reforms. So when I, I was kindly asked uh, uh, to speak on this panel and invited to this conference, uh, one of the f very first uh, things that uh, really caught my eyes is the setup of this panel, and actually all of the panels. Um, and it has a very peculiar setup. Uh, the panelists are all asked to talk about the institutional reforms, but from various uh, perspectives, various geographical uh, 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 and country perspectives, from Western European perspective, from German perspective, from Central European perspective, uh, from the EU candidate country uh, uh, perspective. So this setup first begs the question, I think, whether it's possible to tell, uh, whether it's possible to narrate uh, the integration in one single way, or uh, does the European integration has very different uh, narratives? And if so, how one narratives uh, become dominant among the many? Yes, there are and there always have been many cracks in the European integration. Think about the division between North uh, Germany and uh, the Netherlands and the South, uh, Italy, Spain and, uh, and France. It's largely based on the question of fiscal discipline and uh, budgetary uh, uh, policy. Or we, we can th also think about the big big battles the, in, in previous times, the big battles between UK and the Franco-German tandem. Uh, that was about the 
overall objective of the European integration. But I think one of the most visible cracks uh, today lies probably between uh, West and East, between the old and new, new Europe. Old Europe because it be, be, uh, uh, before the eastward enlargement, uh, and the new Europe, which is the eastward uh, uh, enlargement. And the most important difference is not really economic output. It's not really infrastructure. It's not really living standards. I think the crucial difference is, is, um, lies in the, in the underlying vision on the future and purpose of the whole European uh, uh, integration. And they see these different uh, uh, sides, see uh, the European integrations from different perspectives. And the reason for these different perspectives is there are different historical experiences. One of the defining features of the Western story uh, is uh, the horrors of the Second World War. Uh, and, uh, and that big story underpins uh, uh, the European integration, and it's akin to the famous novel, uh, The Lord of the Flies. So if, if you remember, it, it ends with a scene when the adults arrive and, the, and step onto the island and, and, and try to stop uh, the children from tearing uh, uh, each other apart. And, and that's, the, that's their vision of the, the, the European integration, that the EU is like the arrival of the adult. It's an organization of parents uh, to keep the children in check. So accordingly, it has kept the peace uh, uh, between member states so well. And that explains why, or at least can explain, why uh, it's rather the old Europe, European construction, which is considers its own privilege to define what values are European, what rule of law is, and how member states shall adjust uh, 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 to them. But the Central European experience is quite different. People in Central Europe uh, lived under one totalitarian regime, ideology, uh, and oppression after another. What they fought for long, long decades was to restore national identity and self-determination. And it's the very insistence of their, this history and their tradition and their, their, their nation state that, that were the protectors of the peoples in Central and Eastern uh, Europe. So they owe their survival to this insistence. Um, and therefore, they saw a European integration, cooperation as a, as a kind of a building that can better protect and also express national uh, identities, sovereignties, and maybe cultural heritage as well. So the different um, um, religion, uh, regions have different perspectives uh, based on different historical experiences, and, um, and that led to different expectations. And they also see the result, results of the European integration uh, differently. Uh, so, the second question is, is there a way to resolve or somehow reconcile uh, those differences? Is there a common European identity? And well, addressing this question will go well beyond this, uh, this topic and, uh, and, uh, and the time of this presentation. I would only emphasize two points here. First of all, even though there are different stories and different perspectives, uh, Europe is characterized by its unique relationship to history, and that's equally true for West, North, South, and East. Um, from little villages to big capital cities, every one of us is living in places which is full of historical monuments and references, stat uh, statues, street names, memorial signs, all remind us of the historical figures once lived or died uh, uh, there. So living in the old continent means living in its history and being constantly reminded of its history and they relive this history over and over again. On the other hand, Europe is much more than a, a simple market or a project or, a, uh, or an international organization. Europe, when, when I say Europe, it's a civilization. It's a civilization that is based on a Greco-Latin heritage and the Jewish-Christian 
uh, uh, tradition. And this civilization gave birth to the world's most astonishing cultural uh, diversity. And this is what binds really Europe uh, 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 together. So when we come down to the institutional question, any institutional cooperation in Europe has no other choice but to embrace these two elements of the European identity. So any institutional setting can only be successful and lasting if it's organized in a way to support somehow these, uh, these principles. Now back to Maastricht. As I mentioned, uh, the period that led up to, the, to this watershed moment uh, uh, was an exceptional success story in the European cooperation. Uh, so it's the desire to achieve economic, economic prosperity through a common market and uh, four freedoms has uh, forged a, a very strong consensus uh, among the member states. And that led to the period of the uh, so-called Les Trente Glorieux, so the tr uh, uh, 30 glorious years that economically, business-wise, uh, security-wise, that reinforced the consensus and legitimacy behind that European um, uh, uh, cooperation. And the European integration has become really an integral landscape, integral part of the European landscape, and it was an attractive and appealing one, and that's why Central European countries long to be part of this success story, long to be part of this European dream. But instead of a speedy uh, eastward enlargement, the Maastricht Treaty chose to first broaden the scope and subject matter uh, of the integration to areas rather uh, belonging to political cooperation. So the European cooperation began to include an increasing and oftentimes maybe excessive uh, number of political uh, uh, objectives. But there was a warning sign right at the beginning since the Maastricht Treaty was never enjoyed a uh, uh, unanimous consensus. And what started in Maastricht should have been fulfilled by the uh, uh, European Convention and, the, and its major result, the, the, the Constitutional Treaty. But when the Constitutional Treaty was put to refer a referendum, uh, both uh, France and, uh, and the Netherlands uh, rejected it. Again, another warning sign that the strong consensus uh, once enjoyed by the European cooperation has weakened. And neither member states nor their, full citizen, uh, nor their citizens fully agree with this direction the European integration was heading. And then came uh, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, which saved some of the shortcomings and some of the weaknesses uh, of the constitutional treaty. And in a certain sense, uh, we still live uh, uh, under that vision of Maastricht. Uh, oops. Yeah, um, and please allow me to highlight a couple of um, uh, uh, relevant points here. So what characterized this Maastricht uh, vision? First of all, centralization. The competence of the European Union is being expanded, continuously expanded, and now applies to a huge number of area, areas. And this creeping uh, extension of competences is mainly driven by the aspirations of the European institutions. European court largely allowed the European institutions to gradually take power from member states and centralize it in their own uh, uh, hands. And that centralization already touched upon some of the core uh, of, um, uh, areas and core questions of constitutional identity, national identity and sovereignty, such as asylum, immigration, religion, uh, family, uh, or national security. The second question is, uh, the second point is uh, the question of European demos, and we already heard about it. The Maastricht Treaty introduced the concept of union citizenship, which is a great concept that was originally built on the, on the national citizenship and part of the national citizenship. However, down the road, uh, what we could see is that this concept has begun to be used as a vehicle uh, to create a non-existent European demos. And this aspiration is actually quite visible in the long proposed and recently propo again proposed uh, transnational list and transnational electorate list. Um, 
uh, that holds the entire uh, uh, area of the European Union as one single uh, uh, constituency. And instead of reinforcing the tie between the representative and the voter, the electorate, um, it, 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 we, it will be even, uh, MEPs will be even more detached from and less responsible to local uh, 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 people. The third point is values and uniformization. As a result of the Maastricht process, the values set out in Article 2, uh, along with the concept of the rule of law, have been increasingly in the forefront of European politics. Now, these values have both political and legal dimensions. The problem is that they have been increasingly legalized and used as um, instruments to short circuit the European political debates in the past decades or so. There are several negative sides of it. There's a danger of standardization uh, because that process ultimately weakened the diversity of European legal traditions, stifled democratic debate and deliberation on a European as well as on a local uh, uh, level. And it also runs the risk uh, of discouraging the competitive, the natural competitive spirit of a very diverse uh, 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 continent. And last but certainly not least, uh, the, uh, the concept of the ever closer union. Um, and, and, and that concept, along with the centralization and uniformization, transformed um, uh, down the road and uh, became a symbol uh, of, 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 of an integration that is the end goal in itself. So the, basically the American idea of a pluribus unum uh, so one out of many. And this is exactly the opposite of the very original idea of the European cooperation, which, uh, which is saying as a symbol that in very varietate concordia, so unity in diversity. So as a result of this vision, the integration was becoming increasingly removed from the, the elements of the common European uh, identity, less willing to embrace uh, the civilizational heritage, and less willing to cherish uh, the cultural uh, diversity of the member state. And by the time the eastward enlargement occurred, uh, the European integration already uh, headed in a different direction uh, from the one that Central European countries uh, once uh, uh, dreamed of at the, uh, at the beginning of the 1990s. When we consider uh, turning to the question of institutional reform. When we consider institutional reform, we first have to be aware of what needs to be addressed. So in, a, in order to streamline the European institutional arrangement or landscape, uh, one first has to address the question what the European integration is good for in the 21st uh, century. And, uh, and the real question, I think, we think, is not whether we want more or less Europe, uh, let alone whether we want a, a federate, federal state or a constitution, uh, but in the eyes of the overwhelming majority of the people in the European integration, uh, in the Europe, the integration is not an end in itself, uh, nor is it self-evident anymore. It uh, has to be based on very pragmatic cost-benefit analysis, to what extent it can defend the interest and civilizational heritage of its member states in a world that is defined, increasingly defined with big power rivalry, and to what extent it can serve the well-being and freedom of their citizens in an age of globalization and, and digitization. So it has to justify it and provide reasons continuously provide reasons for its own uh, existence. And any institutional reform uh, shall be the function of this pragmatic uh, uh, analysis. In other words, it shall be a mean to an end instead of an end uh, uh, in itself. And I only want to mention uh, uh, one, uh, since I, I, I lack the time, uh, one, uh, uh, one of the two problematic institutions, uh, uh, the European Parliament, but the European Parliament uh, in recent uh, uh, years is clearly unable to uh, fulfill its original uh, uh, functions. Uh, even though 
uh, its competencies have been uh, continu continuously expanded. Uh, it has shaken the confidence uh, of the citizens. It deals, it tries to deal with everything, uh, but it e increasingly unable to uh, conduct a meaningful uh, debates that are relevant to the citizens uh, and meaningful and important to the member states. And to address this uh, uh, shortcoming, the ties between and, and the responsibility between the representatives and the electorate uh, should be strengthened. And this could be reinforced by the introduction of a European election system that is based on smaller individual constituencies. Uh, and at the same time, um, uh, the European democracy shall become the democracy of national democracies, uh, which was the original idea. And to this end, uh, the participation and role of national parliaments uh, should be increased. And their participation, if, if their participation is increased uh, in the European legislative process, it could serve as a guarantee for subsidiarity. And if it serves as a guarantee of subsidiarity, it can uh, promote uh, cultural uh, uh, diversity, um, which uh, leads us to our final point. Um, only institutionalized cooperation can provide uh, the European states with the essential resilience, uh, leverage, and competitiveness in an age of globalization, digitization, and big power rivalry. Um, but an institutional arrangement is never an end in itself. It shall serve, it shall always serve the well-being and freedom of the peoples of the member states and the prosperity and sovereignty uh, of the member states. It shall start and end with them. But even more importantly, any institutionalized uh, arrangement can only be considered European if it knows how to recognize and how to protect the civilizational roots that unite Europe and connect the people living in the old uh, continent. A thousand years old civilization doesn't need to be uh, invented and reinvented over and over again, but instead it need, needs to be safeguarded in order to protect us uh, uh, Europeans. So institutions only deserve to be called European uh, if they are able to comprehend and preserve uh, this heritage, this civilization, uh, and, with, and, and this cultural diversity that, always, that has al have always made Europe a unique uh, uh, place and the best place to live around the world. So thank you so much for your attention.